Um, our next speaker is coming from New York. It's uh, Frederica Schur. She's uh, from Cloudera Fast Forward Labs. Um, and she actually works as a research engineer, focusing on new research uh, that's coming out of academia and then trying to actually find use cases in the enterprise and building production grade software there. Um, she actually trained uh, as a PhD at UCL and did a postdoc at NYU. So we're very happy to bring her back all the way to London. So with that, let's welcome Federica. I'm going to talk about from innovation to application and then specifically multitask learning for classification. But I want to start sort of by framing the, the research that I'm going to cover in the middle section of my talk. So I was very excited to be invited here um, because when I looked at the mission statement of this, uh, of, um, of this conference, I learned that uh, it's a nonprofit with a mission to increase participation, access to education and resources in AI in order to help advance the greater good. That's great, I thought, because our original founding mission of Fast Forward Labs was to fast track knowledge transfer from the lab to industry. Our tagline is we find industry applications for technical innovation. Specifically, what we are looking at is technology that will find applications within industry within the next six months to two years. That is a very tight time frame, especially when you compare it to um, research that is more typically done in a lab. Um, it is great for us because it means that we are quite accountable because uh, someone will remember in six months what we said six months before, two years. Um, there are three mechanisms how we do this. So we do uh, in-house applied machine learning research and that's largely what I'm going to talk about today. But we also have two other mechanisms of delivery. One is we do workshops and advising. We work with corporate clients from startups to large enterprise companies in order to help them understand what are the opportunities that are actually opened up by a technical innovation. And then also, crucially, how do you realize those opportunities? Rarely, we also build in-house prototypes. We do this largely so that we get a chance to play with clients' data. There's a lot that's interesting about data that is uh, often um, in large corporations and hard to access, though we prefer not to do that too often because really our mission is to increase the in-house data science and machine learning capabilities. Um, and just to give a bit of history on the company um, that sort of again situates what we're doing. So Fast Forward Labs, we were founded by academics in 2014, still a team of largely academics. Uh, we're neuroscientists, myself, I'm a neuroscientist, physicist. Currently, we have a resident anthropologist. It's very fun to work with an anthropologist in the, in the world of big data. And then we were acquired by Claudera in September 2017. So the context of that, and I just kind of cherry pick a little bit, is um, September 2016, Google announced the Advanced Solutions Lab. And they do something quite similar to the mechanisms that we use. Um, in 2017, AWS advanced the, uh, announced the Machine Learning Solutions Lab, very similar name. Again, sort of a similar set of activities. And then also in the startup world, I believe there are people here from Element AI, very exciting. They also raised a very big Series A. And for me, what that shows is that um, that there is sort of currently a, a flurry of activity going on where um, we're trying to really connect some of the exciting innovations within machine learning with what they can actually realize, like what can they do in the world, what problems can they solve. And that's currently really difficult, which is why we're sort of like seeing these, these um, kind of like uh, crossover activities between industry and sort of more research-oriented facilities. And that's really, I like to talk a lot about, uh, we're currently on a quest to find the right abstractions and the right interfaces for machine learning into AI that makes it sort of easy to use and easy to actually solve real problems. And I like to sort of show this, uh, German is a Steckdose. Um, I like to show this sort of wall plug here. Um, that is because Andrew likes to talk about AI as being the new electricity. And so I like to think about this as like, okay, we have to find the right interfaces. We have to know like how we plug things in so that it actually works. And with electricity, we've figured this out. And we haven't figured this out yet with machine learning and AI. And I think that is currently something that's very exciting because once we figure out the right levels of abstractions and the right interfaces, it's really going to impact the tools that we have, programming languages that we have. It's going to impact how the platforms are designed. It's going to impact jobs and roles. Like the sort of, uh, they're going to differentiate much more. 
Um, it's also going to change how we talk about it. I think uh, even at the level of communication, like it is still very difficult sometimes to sort of like to get um, researchers to talk successfully with people that are not quite as deeply steeped in the technology and vice versa. Uh, there's no one to blame in this. It is just that we are solving a hard problem because it is a new technology. Um, and I think in part we sort of like, we ended up in a situation where we have currently this sort of gap, it's in part because it's new and so we're figuring things out because it's new. But I think it's also um, because we're typically telling a particular story about how innovation happens. And that sort of story, it's very much centered on um, the great innovators. Um, and the great innovators, they innovated and then the world was better. And so we credit them also. And I'm showing you Louis Pasteur. Uh, he's probably one of the reasons why quite a large section of us are alive today. He invented pasteurization, of course. Um, and so there, there are Louis Pasteur streets all over France, right? He, he is definitely sort of a, um, a person that is very much uh, remembered for his great achievements. But, and this is uh, the book that I'm showing him in the corner, but if you actually look at how his innovation reached the public, then you can see that there was a whole movement, the hygienists actually, that it, that it sort of piggybacked on. Um, and they did a lot of work in the field. They talked to people. They figured out how you talk to people. Um, they figured out how you get people excited about it. What's interesting, and I, I very much enjoyed the read, is also that politically, um, people were waiting for an idea like this because um, the sort of nobility wasn't very happy that they could uh, have the same diseases as sort of the, the working class. So um, it is always about the context within which innovation happens that determines how it is going to spread. Um, and so the, and, and, but because of how we tell history, like that sort of contribution is often overlooked. And then that means that because we overlook it, we are so likely to create gaps. That's the gap that we want to fill. Back to our mechanism. So uh, research, workshop devising, and prototypes. I'm going to focus on the research. The output of the research, actually, uh, we write physical books, which is a very, to me, very satisfying activity. Um, and, we, uh, and they're available to our clients. We also build fully functioning prototypes that go with each book. And here you see a selection of, of the books that came out of past research deep dives. Um, and this is, uh, for me, there was a very new coming sort of out of academia where you focus on one idea for a relatively long time. We shift focus entirely. Every four to six months, we get into a different area and we try to make as much progress as we can. And so for us, really, what is very critical is like, how do we actually then decide what we're going to work on? That's one of the most important decisions that we have to make. And here's sort of the process in a nutshell, really. Um, we always have big whiteboards, physical and digital, out. And we just gather ideas on these whiteboards throughout the year and really there's no filter and it takes a bit of training to actually take all filter out of that but we're expressly looking for very bad ideas um, on these sort of whiteboards and then we meet every four months and we go through all the ideas and we just like brief off the cuff introductions like what have you read about what do you know like do you know what it is um, and then we remove ideas where we can say okay not this time and then we do three more rounds um, and we research your remaining ideas, first for one hour, then for one day, and then for one week. Um, and we remove ideas after each round, and then from a shortest of one to three remaining ideas, we look into them, and we look at how we could and how we would build them. And then typically, there's sort of one or two ideas that are surface that really, it seems to be the right time for us to do that sort of deep dive. Timing is often really important. And then we focus on them for our research deep dives about four months. Um, and here's how we actually evaluate these kind of ideas. Um, first, does it or could it solve a real problem? And that is where it's good for us to have these industry relations because um, we work with our clients, we advise our clients, and so we see kind of what problems do they have, what problems do they have where the current solutions are just not quite cutting it anymore. Um, and then specifically, we look at, is it more possible to do this now than a year ago? Do we, for example, have better tools, libraries or framework now compared to last year? Have there been relevant changes in hardware, storage or compute? Do we have more or better data or data that we could make more use of? And then finally, uh, have there been relevant research breakthroughs that we can sort of capitalize on? And then to get the timing right, we sort of think, will it find adoption within six months to two years? And then also we look at, does it lend itself to commodification? And I want to talk about that last point a little bit more. So um, 
<laughs> one size fits all fits no one, it is sort of a, a cliche to say. But um, ideas that lend themselves to commodification, essentially those are ideas where um, if a client has a specific problem that they want to solve, for example, image recognition, right? Um, and, and they have sort of like described like what their specific problem is. Um, I want to discriminate cats from dogs, right? So, okay, great. And then you have like 10 other clients and they also have an image recognition problem. Now, if all those clients want to discriminate cats from dogs, then you have a commodifiable problem because then you can build a one size fits all solution that then can sort of address those client needs. But very often, problems are not quite like that. You have very specific requirements. And so um, still up until now, like often in-house software, uh, in-house development can give you better tools, especially in areas where you, your specific problem doesn't overlap with the generic version of your problem. Um, and I sort of always like to tell a story here. This is from a German media company and uh, they came to us and they were very uh, unhappy with an American image recognition company because they were feeding them soccer images. Um, and it was classified as war zones, because <laughs> which maybe there's something to it. But um, but there was, of course, because that kind of sport, it, it pictures were not part of a of a data set that an American company used for image recognition, right? And that is often, of course, which which can or which can sometimes explain these sort of discrepancies. Um, and so what I want to talk about is a research deep dive that is currently ongoing, and that is a deep dive into multitask learning, specifically for classification. And I want to use it in order to illustrate sort of uh, these, these different principles that I talked about. So just very briefly at a sort of cartoon level, uh, what is multitask learning for classification? So single task learning, um, all of you guys are familiar with this. You have data, features, you have label, you're trying to like um, get a model that essentially gives you good predictions of those labels and then sort of, um, and multitask learning you essentially you don't have one set of labels you have two set of labels and you're trying to like build one model that is able to predict both and of course it's not limited to two you can have many more and there's some interesting studies where they do many more specifically within virtual drug screening which is a very exciting field um, but that's sort of the basic concept it comes in two varieties um, you can also have two data sets that are somewhat related um, and they have one label set each and you can still sort of use a multitask approach here. Um, and the sort of uh, inspiration for that is, is that um, if, you, if you have related tasks, so each set of label is essentially one task, then, um, and, and they are related, then you can essentially learn from the fact that there are sort of relationships from the task. You can utilize that. And this is from the movie Karate Kid. I have to admit I've actually never seen it, this movie, and my colleagues tell me I should because I talk about it all the time now. Um, <laughs> But uh, there's a sort of like famous like he has to like paint a fence and he has to like do all these sort of menial chores and it's like why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And eventually, like uh, the sort of sage tells him, it's like, oh, this is because it actually helps you prepare for the sort of defensive blocks, right? That that you will have to perform. And uh, multitask learning is very similar, where you sort of utilize these kind of task relationships in order to um, sort of train these models that can benefit from those relationships. One of the benefits. Um, and so how does this fit our criteria? Does it, or could it solve a real problem? Yes, because everyone who we know is doing classification. Um, pretty much all of our clients, it's a very sort of generic problem. And um, multitask, and, and most of all, what they have is they have lots of uh, related smaller data sets, maybe because of changes in data collection protocols. So there's actually a real need for something that allows you to sort of utilize it. Is it more possible now than a year ago? Yes. Um, and here are some sort of reasons that could power a, a range of topics, but also this one. Uh, because now we have more user-friendly modular deep learning frameworks that actually allow you to more easily build um, these kind of models and algorithms. Have there been relevant changes in hardware storage and compute? Yes, uh, though they're the same ones that have been driving generally the adoption of deep learning over the past years. Um, do we have more better data or data that we could make more use of? Yes, especially the last one. Um, few companies these days have access to um, one large clean data set, right? That's sort of the dream and is often curated for research purposes. But then if you try to indeed take an innovation and, and help it find its applications, and at that point you're sort of encountering data that just looks different, it's harder to work with, it's messier, and there may not be the resources to actually curate one that's very clean, even though sometimes it may be advisable. Um, Several companies have like smaller, uh, several smaller and related data sets. You see this a lot in healthcare, and healthcare is actually one of the areas where multitask learning is already finding more sort of uh, adoption than in some other areas. 
Um, and have there been relevant research breakthroughs? Um, yeah, like a bunch. Um, they are sort of more components of networks, but you can essentially use them also in order to build multitask networks, and I'm going to cover them in a bit. Um, does it lend itself to modification? Not really, and that's good for our purposes, because if we work with um, client companies in order to help them sort of level up their in-house knowledge, then at that point, um, if it lends itself to commodification, honestly, a lot of companies, they should buy solutions. It is good to buy solutions. You don't have to do everything in-house. As long as it is doing as good a job as you need it to do, that's really fantastic, right? Um, but then, and that's currently really difficult for companies to make this decision, like buy versus build. What should I build in-house? Well, technology that doesn't really lend itself to commodification, that is what we want to support. And so that is why it is good for us that this particular technology doesn't really lend itself to that. Will it find adoption? I covered that at the end of my talk. Um, at a high level, sort of conceptually, multitask learning, how and why it works. So typically when you have, let's stick with the simplest case, two label sets, the noise um, that is added to these label sets is typically independent in most cases. Um, and so then at that point, the algorithm can essentially learn to average out that noise. And that's also really great because, um, well, you have less susceptibility to noise, but also it generally helps with overfitting because um, like if you start to fit the noise of one of the tasks, the other task is going to suffer. You try to optimize for both of them jointly, so then overall performance actually goes down at that point. Um, also, uh, what is great for it can sort of extract shared features. So features that can actually power both tasks. So they're sort of more abstract, more gen generalizable. One of the advantages of multitask learning um, is that it can, it has a potential to better generalize to new data and also to <coughs> new tasks. Um, and then also what I think is quite clever, like you can also use a mechanism called eavesdropping in order to um, really force algorithms to learn how to learn features um, by sort of essentially providing them as a label. And that is often done in um, natural language processing. Um, so when to use it? Well, there's not really a good straightforward measure, uh, way to measure task relatedness. Chances are the tasks are related if they're from the same domain. Um, part of speech tagging, syntactic parsing, semantic entailment, uh, those uh, are drawn from the same domain and that is also where multitask learning has found applications and so showing here uh, Spacey and they're using multitask learning as part of their sort of natural language processing package. Um, it is good to use when you have access to several smaller related data sets. When your data contains useful features that are unavailable during inference, you can then use those actually as a, as a secondary task. Um, during multitask learning. So instead of discarding them, you can actually make use of them. Um, when you have cause labels, um, because if you um, have more finer grade re grain related measures, it can allow you to recover um, some of the subtlety in your data. When you have noisy labels, because it's because of the independent noise uh, with the task. When there's more than one, measure, one way to measure a target or something that you're interested in with unique up and down sides, then you can actually include all of them as sort of a task. And then you can really draw on the up and on the down sides. When you want to train a model to be accurate and fair, um, you can uh, basically add quantitative measures of fairness. They do exist in addition to accuracy and optimize for both of them. Um, also, it's nice to see this mentioned earlier, when you want to avoid catastrophic forgetting during model transfer, essentially, um, you can sort of remind itself by adding it as a secondary task of what the earlier model, the one that you are now transferring new to a new task, learned. Um, Crucially, it's an approach, it's not an algorithm. In principle, there's a single and a multitask version of every supervised classification algorithm. So in our, if in our work, we actually build multitask decision trees and we build multitask random forest in order to sort of showcase, um, hey, you know these algorithms already, like they're sort of workers algorithms in data science. How would you turn them multitask? Um, and then we build several multitask neural networks. I'm going to talk about them now. Um, and I'm just going to talk about one of the ones that we built. We built it for Amazon review data. Two tasks is actually, the task is to say whether or not a review is positive or negative. There are two tasks. We one is for reviews that comes from electronics, sort of gadgets, and one is Kindle book reviews. Um, and then news articles. And here the two tasks are actually news articles that are taken from tabloid newspapers and from broadsheet newspapers. Um, and here, and, and we were interested in that because broadsheet and uh, tabloid newspapers, they tend to use different language. Um, so there's sort of like a, a, a difference really um, in, the, in the words they use and the complexity of sentences. But there's also a difference in coverage. Um, and so as we, this is a data set that we actually gathered and curated. Um, 
I sort of saw that because of differences in coverage, there are some categories that overlap news, sports, entertainment. There are also some that are unique, for example, to Broadway, like world news, business, politics. And this is a simplified picture, right? Because if you sort of go a little bit deeper into that, like the tabloid news actually comprises world news and politics, as well as news. And some of the politics actually is in the tabloid opinion. <laughs> so there's definitely some sort of like overlap and relatedness, but there's sort of also a complex difference and relationship. Um, and so, of course, what you can do, you can build single task neural networks, one for broadsheet, one for tabloid uh, news articles. Um, if you make them multitask, then essentially here's sort of a, a basic version. You add two output um, nodes, um, and they're for one prediction. But here, in this particular case, it is feeding off a shared word embedding and then also shared LSDM. We used LSDMs here for a prototype that I'm going to show later. Um, there are other architectural choices, of course. A lot of you are familiar sort of with the different trade-offs. Um, then uh, one can also build a network that has different subspaces. So here, essentially, you say, OK, I acknowledge that there may be some shared features that are useful to learn. So um, we include a subspace that actually is supporting both classification tasks, but then also we include sort of private um, subspaces that allow to uh, sort of learn information that is only useful for one task. And then in order to actually ensure that those can cleanly separate, we use regularizers. Um, the one that I want to talk about more is the adversary regularizer. So here, essentially, we're trying to predict which task um, the shared LSTM uh, is currently received the data from. Um, and if we could do that successfully, then at that point, there's, of course, uh, task-specific information in the shared layer. And we don't want there to be any task-specific information in the shared layer. So we try to push that out. Quickly, some details. Um, so we use unidirectional LSTM. It is because we're building a prototype that sort of mimics uh, human reading. Um, and so that was for prototype purposes. Um, and uh, then we have a, sort of the classifier layer. We have task-specific dropout and learning rates, both for the extractor, for the different layers of the extractor, and also for the different layers of the output. Those are all different hyperparameters, and also different dropout and learning rates for the discriminator. Um, with the fully shared network, it essentially has two terms as part of the loss function for the two different tasks. Um, if you have data sets that um, are of unequal size, you can essentially weigh the different batch sizes. And so then you can sort of take advantage of the larger data sets sort of and, and uh, or the, the, the fact that one data set's larger. With the adversarial, with the subspaces, uh, there's a four-term loss function because of the regularizers that we're adding. Um, here, the different, um, the sort of contribution, essentially, how much each loss term is contributing to it. We put that also as a hyperparameter. They work really well. Um, Yes, so this is sort of the general kind of setup of what we were doing here. Um, go back one more. Um, one of the things is also we, the different sort of ways classically how these multitask neural networks are trained. Very often you're sort of switching between tasks. You're feeding a batch from one data set through. That's what I saw in the literature a lot. You're feeding one data set sort of through, um, and then you do the back propagation to update your parameters. For us, it didn't work so well, especially with the adversary regularizer. So we basically drew batches from both. We fed them through, and then we only did the backward pass once actually the network had received batches from both tasks. Um, here are the results. My model is still training <laughs> on one of them. Um, but essentially what we see here, for the Amazon, Amazon review data, we see that the fully shared network um, did the best job. Um, for us, actually, funnily enough, these accuracy metrics are not that important, but it was good to see the fully shared does, the, does a good job, also for the news articles. Um, the difference here is bigger for the news articles, which is probably because it is a more complex task. Multitask learning for very simple tasks is not really something that is needed. It is, it is something that you want to do when, you, when you're dealing with sort of com more complex tasks. And here, for the news articles, the, the sort of model with the adversary regulars and subspaces, that is still training right now. It takes way longer because of the adversarial regularizer. Quickly, um, to just sort of show some results here, um, this is for the news data. Um, and there's some sort of understandable confusion. So like we see that it confuses lifestyle and entertainment, um, which if we actually look at those articles, it's pretty difficult for a human to keep the teeth them apart. Um, generally, we found we need lower learning rates for the extractor compared to the classifier. Um, classifier is just the output. Higher dropout for the discriminator. Uh, combined training outperforms alternating training because tuning the adversary regularizer is tricky. So here's just the accuracy on the on the adversary regularizer on the on uh, for a whole set of different experiments. Um, and so here you can see that it tends to go to like the sort of extremes which is not unknown in in the sort of like uh, generally with sort of adversarial approaches. Um, and so that is uh, that is one of the challenges here. 
Um, quickly, prototype. So we always build a prototype um, because really, if we work with a client who maybe is not quite so technical, then a prototype is a really good way of showcasing value and showcasing the approach. And like one of our sort of like mission, I also think is to really um, help people develop a vision of what their company could look like if they were to use more machine learning in their organization. Um, here's one that I like particularly, how uh, tabloid newspapers were classifying the first article as news and the broadsheet newspapers were classifying it as entertainment. Those kind of results was kind of what I was hoping for when I was building this. Um, then if you're, if you're then curious, then you can sort of click on an article and you can actually see um, how the network is sort of reading through. These are the different, the colors are the different categories. And on the side, you can sort of see a running bar that shows you um, what, it, what it sort of sees here. Um, and I just wanted to zoom in a little bit that that sort of becomes. So that is a way of kind of seeing, hey, what does the network actually pick up on? How does it actually do that? Um, we also wanted to see generally, sort of not just for a specific article, like which kind of words the model actually learned to get a sense of, okay, what's going on here? So we were looking at, um, our, our mechanism for that was to identify a target word and then basically look at, okay, what typically comes before the target word because the unidirectional LSTM. We look at words that really push the probability to one of the particular categories or also ones, we call them context words, that only ever occur when the probability is already very high. Just quickly, for world news, what I found interesting is administer Ukraine, Gaza, missiles, Taliban, Houthi, Egypt, Syria. Pretty good. Sports, I actually learned that birth actually is something that has to do with sports. <laughs> so um, it sort of was useful for me. Um, we um, are running out of time. I'm going to go through this quickly. We then also were interested in, OK, what do the specific subspaces contribute? So uh, this sort of comes from a neuroscience training. I'm like, OK, when I want to see the contributions, I interfere with a particular region. And then I see what are the functional consequences for behavior. I, again, use my word surfacing method. And here, what I found interesting is that, especially for the context words, I mainly got uh, names uh, from people from the task agnostic layer, so the one that is shared between the two different tasks. Rusev, Merkel, Park, Yellen, Haley, Ortega, sort of names that make a lot of sense, actually, that that comes out here. And the hope with that is to actually be able to recover some of these task relations, because while the network is doing supervised classification, it is also in an unsupervised way, essentially figuring out how these tasks are related. So you don't need Mr. Miyagi from Karate Kid to tell you what's the relationship. It can actually, the network can do that by itself. But of course, because a lot of this is also used um, in healthcare, as I said earlier, where you um, want to sort of look at phenotype and, and sort of see which genetic sequences are sort of producing certain phenotypes. And so here, actually gaining these insights is very advantageous. Um, it is not changing to the next slide. Oh, there we go. Um, great. So reading the news, just wanted to sort of show you. It was really fun to read a lot of tabloid newspapers. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on with eels these days. <laughs> and I was pleased that it was classified as, as lifestyle. <laughs> I hope they're having a good time. <laughs> um, also, sometimes... Uh, Tokenization gives you more of a picture into reality than what you were hoping for. Um, <laughs> so Mr. Co Michael Cohen and president was considered one entity. It's very unfortunate. Um, will it find adoption within the next six months to two years? I think that really the biggest hurdle is that data scientists, machine learning engineers at companies have been really, really trained in um, isolating single task problems. Data sets have been collected in a way that they support single task approaches. Um, and especially the sort of framing uh, part, and I think that's one of the most important things that a data scientist does, it's very hard to sort of change how you approach problems. But talking about abstractions earlier, I'm excited especially about that part, like how do we sort of um, change how we even think about approaching the world. And multitask learning essentially allows you to present a slightly more complex slice of reality to your model, and, and, it, and it, it can cope with it. Um, before I close, each of our like deep dives includes also a big cha chapter on ethics. How is this work going to impact potentially the world? And then also, uh, we always work with authors to write a sci-fi story that kind of um, showcases what the world might look like um, if this technology really becomes widespread. Um, we do it as an imaginary exercise, really, and also sometimes as a cautionary tale. Um, we've put a lot of them online recently, so I encourage you to check them out. Thank you.